Welcome back, everybody, to our last session of this conference. Uh, I will be a panelist here, and so I'd like to introduce uh, our moderator, John Donahue, my colleague uh, from the law school and one of the organizers of this conference, uh, to introduce the, the whole panel. One of our panelists is going to only join us later, um, but we'll get started here. Thank you so much, Anat. I'm delighted to welcome everyone to the grand finale of our three-day conference. Our topic is corporations and the justice system. Uh, in the session that just ended, Alex Wilson of the U.S. Attorney's Office in the Southern District specifically addressed the government's decision in the face of corporate wrongdoing, whether to prosecute the corporation versus a top corporate executive. Our session will now sort of drill down into the broad issue of how and whether the justice system can effectively deter misconduct and hold powerful actors properly accountable, not just for paying bribes as the last session discussed, but whenever they act in ways that cause substantial and preventable harm. So we have an absolutely uh, blue ribbon set of panelists, and I would like to begin by introducing all three of our stars in the order in which they will make their initial comments. We will First here from uh, Vic Khanna, who is uh, both a good friend and also uh, uh, the uh, Lee Bates Lee Global Professor of Law at the University of Michigan Law School and the faculty co-director of the Joint Center for Global Corporate and Financial Law and Policy, uh, which is a collaboration between Michigan Law School and India's Jindal Global Law School. So Vic wears many hats. He's an expert in corporate and securities law, white collar crime, law and economics, uh, corporate governance in emerging markets and law in India. Uh, so uh, Vic is also a, a sort of a global citizen. He's, uh, 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 you know, lived all over the world from uh, India to New Zealand. Uh, he got his uh, SJD at Harvard and has um, written important papers on corporate criminal liability and also on uh, corporate fraud. So we'll be interested to hear his comments. Anad Admati, of course, is the, uh, the brains behind our, our conference here and uh, uh, is the George Parker Professor of Finance and Economics and the Director of Corporations and Society Initiative. You've probably heard Cassie mentioned a number of times throughout the conference. Uh, she has her PhD from Yale University um, and also is the co-author uh, with Martin Helwig of uh, the very important book, uh, The Banker's New Clothes, What's Wrong with Banking and What to Do About It. So she, Anat is absolutely a force of nature. If you don't know her, you probably are getting a sense of that from this conference. Uh, and she is one of the most important voices in the academy, uh, sort of pushing economists and lawyers to reconsider the very nature of corporate goals and obligations, uh, challenging uh, Milton Friedman's uh, notions of what those corporations are, obligations are. And uh, again, we, we look forward to uh, Anat's specific comments in this panel. The third member, as Anat mentioned, uh, will join us a little bit later, but I'll introduce him now. Brandon Garrett is a professor of law at Duke Law School. He received his BA from Yale and his law degree from Columbia. He's a very prolific and wide ranging scholar, has uh, written many fine books, but uh, the one that's most germane to our topic today is the book, Too Big to Jail, How Prosecutors Compromise with Corporations and that's a Harvard University Press book uh, from 2014. So anyone who has attended the first two days of the conference knows that there are major issues confronting the US and indeed all countries in terms of whether corporations are imposing avoidable and enormous social costs and risks to health, economy, the environment, our democracy. And in general, we look to the criminal justice and tort system to restrain those who would impose large social costs. Uh, but the performance of these systems uh, has struggled in trying to avoid the enormous costs and burdens of the financial crisis, the opioid crisis, the staggering and seemingly growing flaws in, in and threats to our democracy, the burgeoning propagation of falsehood, uh, and the potentially catastrophic consequences of global climate change. So can the US justice system 
pose credible threats of criminal and civil liability to avoid or reduce these harms and provide just treatment of those who violate legal mandates. Do we need better laws that make it easier to establish fraud or create liability? Um, are the laws fine and we just need uh, better enforcement from the US Department of Justice and state attorney generals? Is detection the big problem? Uh, so things like whistleblower statutes or key TAM provisions might need improvement. Um, and how is the role of corporate actors in lobbying for loopholes uh, creating problems for our society? So this, these are some of the questions we'd like to uh, address. Let me start off by turning to Vic and saying, Vic, can you sort of start us off with an overview of issues around corporate criminal liability, explaining, explaining the basic structure and goals of this approach? Uh, many members in our audience may not be familiar with the idea of the corporation itself being a criminal. So what does this all mean? Can you start us off, Vic? Uh, thank you, John, for that very uh, generous introduction. And thank you, Anat, for inviting me in the committee. I'm very much looking forward to this. Very much enjoyed the first uh, few days of the conference here. Uh, so John asked a really good question, which is how does the criminal law regulate uh, corporate behavior? And perhaps the very first thing to begin with is the notion that the corporation is kind of an odd fit in the criminal law. Uh, traditionally, the criminal law is thought to really target people who have a bad state of mind and who you can punish by sending to jail or some other kind of corporal punishment. Uh, it's not always easy to identify what the state of mind of a corporate entity is or whose state of mind you would look at. And sending them to jail, of course, as a non sequitur, you can't. Um, so that in that regard, the corporation is a very odd fit to the criminal law. Having said that, that has not actually deterred folks in uh, expanding the reach of the criminal law to capture corporate behavior. And that is generally true and increasingly across the world. I think maybe the easiest way to begin to describe what the terrain looks like is to sort of note that there are basically three types of approaches to criminal liability of corporate entities. Uh, we have on one extreme, the United States approach which is by far the largest and perhaps the easiest under which to establish liability for the corporate entity. Uh, then in the middle, you sort of have the European approaches such as the UK and France, where uh, you can establish uh, corporate criminal liability, but it's harder to do than in the United States. And it's not for as many things as it's available uh, in the US for. And then finally, traditionally, you have the third category, which is sort of Germany and a few other countries which simply don't allow for criminal sanctions against corporate entities. Although that is beginning to change in some ways with uh, Germany just this year having a bill called the Corporate Sanctions Act that would in effect create criminal liability for corporate entities. Um, maybe I'll just start with the US because that's uh, where we're, you know, all, where most of us are located at the moment. Um, so at least in the United States, the concept of criminal liability for the corporate entity stems from a very simple legal doctrine, which is vicarious liability. What that simply means is that whenever an employee of the company engages in something that amounts to a crime, uh, then the company can be held liable for it uh, on the assumption that this was done basically as part of their job. Um, there's no other additional proof that's required. So a low level employee, a mid-level employee, any of those could actually result, their behavior can result in the imposition of criminal sanctions on the corporate entity. Um, now, one may say, is that, is that a lot? So uh, various people have tried to estimate the extent of corporate criminal sanctions in the United States. Most recent estimates I've seen are somewhere in the range of about 400 to 450,000. So it's e extensive, at least on paper. Um, so there's certainly a lot of law and regulation that can be made criminal. Uh, the attribution of criminal liability is not terribly difficult. In fact, uh, if people wanna know more, I can sort of explicate why it's actually quite easy in the US. Uh, to impose criminal sanctions on the corporate entity in theory. Uh, in other countries, of course, like the UK, the scope for things for which would be treated as criminal is actually narrower. And you can't typically impose criminal sanctions on the corporate entity unless you can identify someone higher up in the corporate echelon that has engaged in wrongdoing. Uh, this is sometimes known as the alter ego theory or something like that. So you need someone with a C in front of their title typically uh, to attribute liability to the corporate entity. Uh, that's typically not common in the US. And then of course you have Germany and other countries which simply uh, until very recently at least have refused to impose criminal sanctions on corporate entities. Although they have a very large range of civil and administrative sanctions 
against corporate entities. Uh, usually the reason for this is uh, something of an aversion to the notion of um, vicariously attributing blame from one or two individuals to an entire group or, in, uh, or entity. Um, in any case, uh, I think the general direction in the world has been towards increasing corporate criminal liability over the last few years, as well as civil liability. And that of course leads to sort of the next question, which is, well, if there's so much increase in criminal sanctions and so much act, you know, sort of activity in this space, this must be doing a great job of policing corporate behavior. Uh, here, of course, is where the rubber meets the road and uh, people will have widely divergent views on this. Uh, but I think increasingly people are very concerned that the criminal enforcement system may not be kicking on all gears. Uh, and typically the concern is that we don't see a lot of individuals going to jail. Uh, companies oftentimes are settled with through something called the deferred prosecution agreement or its close brethren, the non-prosecution agreement or something along those lines, uh, which often leads to simple sanctions on the company. I would mention, of course, uh, that all of this is happening against the background of increasing civil liability for corporate entities, um, which uh, of course may in some respects be more efficient uh, simply because um, the corporation can't be jailed, but it can be fined. Uh, and it turns out that the fines in the civil justice system are actually substantially larger than the criminal justice system, which might seem perverse, but that is the current state of the law. Um, Going on from there, perhaps one other thing that's worth mentioning here, and uh, John mentioned this in his introductory comments, is that um, detection, of course, is always a big concern in this area. Um, one of the things that arises from the corporate structure is the sort of diffusion of responsibility at times that accompanies the hierarchical structures that we might see. But that, of course, makes uh, sometimes it difficult to detect who has done something wrong and sometimes even whether something wrong has occurred. Uh, there have been a number of studies exploring what are sort of the predictors or factors that are associated with uh, incidences of corporate fraud. Um, I won't go over all of that, but I will mention a couple of things that might be of interest to the audience. One, of course, is the fact that it seems that when higher ups are more involved in the company, in particular, when they have more influence at the firm, there seems to be a greater propensity for wrongdoing. And that, of course, raises interesting questions about how one create checks and balances from within a governance system to address concerns of that nature. Um, another thing that's worth noting is that a lot of detection, as Alex mentioned earlier, is often coming from insiders or from the firm itself, uh, which uh, relates uh, specifically to issues of, of, of um, sort of how do you incentivize that provision of information to relevant law enforcement. And we've seen a marked increase in the rise of bounties for whistleblowers. Um, that's become its own sort of subtopic in many ways. There are actually law firms that specialize in doing only that representing whistleblowers who are seeking bounties. Uh, and that is a, quite a lucrative pack, practice in many ways. Uh, the other thing, of course, that's developed over the last few years, as many of you are aware, is the increasing presence of compliance efforts and compliance programs. Uh, often the self-reporting that firms do is in the context of a broader compliance program, uh, and also in some respects designed to get a sentence reduction, or maybe the avoidance of criminal liability in the first place. Um, I think initially when people looked at these, they were highly skeptical of them. Over the last decade, I think we've seen a marked increase in effort on the compliance side, generating much more information that would be of great importance perhaps to those trying to deter or interdict wrongdoing. Um, I would mention uh, two things about sort of the general corporate wrongdoing area. Um, normally speaking, when we're looking at this, we're trying to identify what the incentives are of people to both engage in wrongdoing, but also to block it. And then also, where do they get the information with which they're going to do this? And oftentimes, I think a lot of reforms sometimes miss those two key points. Uh, to the extent that you can incentivize the provision of information or disincentivize the desire to engage in wrongdoing, you are often striking the issue in a way that uh, many other reforms don't necessarily track. Um, and um, I think one of the things that I think Anat mentioned she might discuss is that when it comes to talking about individuals uh, and imposing criminal or civil sanctions on them, it is worth noting that uh, because the criminal law is designed to punish those with a guilty mind, it is often very difficult to capture uh, an individual because of the diffusion of responsibility within the firm. It is often not clear if someone has sufficient knowledge to be treated as having the sufficient sort of state of mind to go to jail for a certain period of time. 
And that raises all sorts of concerns about willful blindness, the sort of ostrich you know, with the head in the uh, sand and things of that nature. Um, it, it is a difficult situation to try to address, but a lot of efforts in the whistleblowing and in the compliance area are designed to create document trails that make it harder for people at the higher levels of a corporate uh, hierarchy uh, to uh, simply state that they didn't know or they didn't have reason to know what was going on. Um, okay. I won't talk much more let, about- let, let, me, let me jump in here, Vic. Uh, sure. I, I appreciate your comments and I, and I do want to turn to a nod sure. to sort of pick up on exactly uh, the point that you were just mentioning. Uh, so or not, uh, do enough corporate executives go to jail? Uh, what would be the benefits of that in your view? Would there be negative repercussions? Uh, uh, fill us in on your thinking right now on this issue. Well, I mean, <clears throat> I belong to the group of people and include, uh, you know, Judge Rakoff, Jesse Eisinger, others that uh, more recently, you know, under enforcement uh, issues, John Coffey, others. Uh, who think definitely not enough executives go to jail, they will tell you uh, that it's not useful, but it definitely is useful. And somebody like uh, Judge Rakoff, who was uh, a prosecutor, a defense lawyer, and now a judge, would say um, that without the possibility of jail, there is no deterrence of, uh, of uh, corporate wrongdoing on the top level. There is no serious desire. Obviously, they don't want to lose money. Joe Grunfest came and said, you know, this is terrible risk and all of that. But oftentimes, it's not detected, as you mentioned, Vic. And um, even when it's detected, the executives very, very rarely have any personal consequences of any uh, context. And it's just enough to go through the most extreme cases of like, you know, Purdue Pharma or cases like that. Or, you know, if you talk about criminal law, you know, right here, before it went, came out of bankruptcy, PG&E, our local utility, uh, admitted in court to 84 counts of manslaughter. This is not the first time that PG&E uh, admitted to manslaughter, which is a crime punishable by prison. And one headline in the newspaper was uh, PG&E uh, uh, dodges 90 years in jail for not being a person. So there you have it, basically. Uh, you know, the corporation can be reckless and in danger, and yet nobody, we're not piercing that corporate veil for responsibility. We heard in the first session that we're piercing it for rights when, uh, when we want rights uh, as a corporation or as a corporate leader, hiring the lawyer to argue on their behalf. Uh, but when is there is a responsibility, nobody's home, no person is home. The corporation uh, will become maybe the scapegoat as some of, uh, as our third panelists sometimes called it. And so you'll go to the corporation to pay, and that means to the shareholders to pay. And then you hope that the shareholders have a governance and they will say, as Luigi Zingale said in the previous session, then we don't want to make money off of this or off of that, of endangering our customers or employees or paying bribes in foreign countries or enslaving uh, children as in the chocolate companies now before the Supreme Court, uh, et cetera, that somehow corporate governance is gonna take care of it. I'm kind of surprised to hear Luigi resort to that uh, out of despair of the, of the, of the legal system uh, because, uh, because earlier on we heard from others on, in, in the organizing committee and elsewhere when Rebecca Henderson, for example, came and said that corporations should you know, take care of society and it's, they should want to do this and, and, and there's a win-win uh, corporate social responsibility and, and, and now the Pope apparently wants it today and all this stuff. Um, that's a total distraction because there is no justice. There is no justice in the corporate uh, section. And I can go on and on. And I wrote an essay recently on Milton Friedman and the need for justice, which uh, only gives hints of what I'm trying to do in my research. This is something uh, that I got into personally. So this has all become very personal to me. A few years ago, I would have been in the previous panel talking about thin political markets and how it is that nonsense can win a, fo a policy debate. At that time, uh, my focus was entirely on the rules themselves and writing bad rules that therefore it's legal to do under those rules all kinds of reckless things. And how come uh, for six years I spent battling that 
particular financial regulation after the financial crisis, and I saw the enablers of what the panel yesterday, first panel spoke to, which is how uh, everybody, our enablers, including academics, make for combined with regulators, regulators who are captured and policymakers who either don't know or don't want to know uh, what is right and wrong, uh, end up endangering the public and the public is not in, in, in aware enough or informed enough uh, to know that they're being so harmed. And I spent years being really outraged and upset by that. It's been a real trauma for me until I got to the point where I dug ever farther into the justice system. And now I think the problems are ever more serious because after the financial crisis, people, you know, whereas I was upset about some small rule that's in Dodd-Frank or in this regulation and, and that and submitting policy comments and seeing that, that thin political market in action, um, everybody else was upset about why you know, executives go to jail after the financial crisis, which I thought, wait a minute, most of it was legal, so you can't get anybody in jail. Let's be upset about what was legal. And, and that sort of didn't work out. So then I started asking, is it just in finance that executives don't go to jail? What happened here? You know, and then here's too big to jail. Well, it's too hard on the corporation. They have employees. We don't want to harm them, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And the executives, no, John, to your question, nothing bad will happen if a few executives went to jail and a lot of good can come out of it if we can find a way to do that. When should we do it? Well, you know, I got into this really more deeply in the fact, in the sense that it keeps me up at night. Uh, in the Wells Fargo case, which was nothing, it was about account opening. You know, people in law would just say, ah, nothing happened, you know. So a few million accounts were opened without permission. Um, you know, eight accounts was great. They're told their employees, the real harm people there were actually the employees who were pressured and fired for either speaking up or not speaking up, for opening the account or not opening the account. So, um, you know, if you, saw, if you see the movie about Wells Fargo, and it was like, this went on for years. Just like the bad laws, you know, persist for years and maybe forever in banking, you know, wrongdoing in many contexts, sexual harassment, you name it, persists for years. How so? And who is responsible when it's a stakeholder who's harmed? Who is a stakeholder? Maybe it's the shareholders, maybe it's the customers, maybe it's the public, maybe it's bad water, or maybe it's DuPont, maybe, you know, on and on and on. So. I think there's an injustice. I think a misconduct can persist in a corporate context by corporation or people acting on behalf of corporations for extended periods of time. And it, it does not get resolved. It often does not get discovered. If it is discovered, the consequences are not enough to deter it in the future. You can go to a website called Good Jobs First, which has a violation tracker. This is where we are now doing the research out of to try to understand how the justice system works or does not work in the corporate context. In other words, who gets justice when a corporation breaks the law on behalf of whoever, the executive, the shareholders. Uh, and the conjecture that I have is that the government gets more justice if it is wrong and that investors get more justice and that other people do not get justice. And this is in a context where we talk about police immunity and, and, and we talked about, uh, you know, corporate rights and we have racial injustice and all kinds of economic injustice. We do not have the absolute basics in equal justice under the law when it comes to corporations. That has become my, my, uh, my conclusion and I have some thoughts about what we need to do to fix it. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Anat. Uh, let me turn back to Vic for a second. So no executive went to jail, as I'm not just mentioned, for the acts leading up to the financial crisis. Uh, is this because no criminal acts were committed or because it was too hard to prove under existing law? Or were these prudential reasons that led the Obama administration to shy away? Um, give us your thoughts, Vic. Um, thanks. Uh, I'd probably say all of the above uh, in some respects, uh, which is uh, kind of what Anat was getting at, I think. And, you know, I would agree with her that uh, to the extent you want to deter wrongdoing in the, in the organizational context, you really want to target the key decision makers. Uh, that is the executives and the others who are making decisions about what to do. Uh, 
of course, the issue is that the way the law is currently written and enforced, uh, that's not always easy to do, um, mainly because uh, you, if you're using the criminal law, um, normally uh, you're going to be required to show a state of mind. Uh, that is that the executives knew or at least were reckless about something. But given the way organizational structures are designed, it's actually very difficult to be able to prove that. Um, and, and that's where the, you know, the rubber hits the road is either A, you then think maybe we go down the civil liability path where things are not necessarily, you don't need that kind of proof. Or alternatively, if you want to do criminal, uh, then you need to find ways to either generate that evidence or alternatively, uh, conceptualize different ways in which you would be comfortable imposing criminal sanctions on, on executives. Uh, and one way to sort of, uh, you know, one nice thing uh, about, uh, you know, the push towards compliance and things like that is it does actually create more evidence uh, that can be used against executives, although how it's used is still sort of being figured out. One of the most interesting things is I think, you know, it's a shame Alex isn't here now, but uh, typically uh, criminal cases against corporations are brought in the hopes that they will identify culpable individuals within the entity that they can then pursue. Uh, that's what prosecutors tell you. Now, whether they do that or not will depend, of, of course, upon individual cases and things. But uh, in theory, uh, the logic behind going after a corporation criminally, since you can't send it to jail, would be hopefully to gather information about individuals that you could hold culpable. Um, my impression is that that occurs a little more than it used to, but nowhere near the level where you might expect it to be if, you know, if you're looking at the types of wrongdoing we're looking at. If you look at the opioid crisis in particular um, with Purdue Farm and all that, uh, it, it seems hard to believe that there wouldn't be more uh, executive cases being brought at this point. Uh, one suspects that a lot of uh, sort of interesting deals are made uh, in, in the process of settling with a corporation in terms of the access to the information that's given, who is getting what, and what evidence that leaves available to uh, you know, prosecute individuals. I think a lot of that sort of deal making is sort of the sausage making process that um, you know, is sometimes difficult to, to judge from the outside, but it does seem to be the case that you know, increasingly there would be better tracks of evidence than we normally have uh, against executives, but we don't necessarily see an increase in that. Now, specifically for the uh, financial crisis, a lot of the behavior was not uh, criminal at the time. And a lot of it was just simply, they didn't appear to have uh, sufficient proof. And I think as the not correctly states that that's, you know, uh, that seems at some level outrageous that you, know, you could have that kind of damage caused. Uh, and um, you know, a lot of it appeared to be, you know, let's say reckless, uh, some might argue, uh, and not much individual responsibility that's attached. And that, that does seem a little strange. And of course that undermines one's faith in what's happening. Uh, I can say that uh, attempts to you know, generate evidence and information have been increasing. One may argue about whether they've been really all that effective. Thank you, Vic. Uh, interestingly, in the financial uh, crisis situation, uh, uh, there have been claims that the blowback from the financial crisis, uh, you know, sort of gave fuel to some of the populist sentiments that affected the democracy in a big way. Uh, and yet, um, we, we don't see the same degree of concern from the public about the literally tens of thousands of deaths that uh, might be attributed to uh, Purdue Pharma. Um, and, and obviously, if, if someone shoots one person, uh, there's a good chance they're going to go away for many years. But if you killed uh, tens of thousands in this sort of more diffuse way, uh, you may be able to avoid uh, criminal liability entirely. Um, so. Uh, Maybe you could say a little bit about this, uh, Anat. Uh, yeah. uh, is, there an, is there enough uh, pain inflicted on the executives of Purdue Pharma with fines that they have to pay? Obviously, uh, if it's just coming out of the shareholders' pocket, that's, that's not necessarily going to be a big deterrent. No, there is not enough. And, you know, there is a talk of a Yates memo and, uh, you know, they'll have to throw somebody under the bus. It will not usually be an executive and it will not be 
Um, and we just haven't seen it happen in so many of the cases. And in, you know, when you look, I mean, it is in the context of, of overall, both what we conceptualize as, as wrong and punishable criminally against individuals. These, this is in the context of white collar crime, we'll probably get to that. And the way we view certain highly, high, you know, highly respectable people in society, that they're not criminal. And I have had discussions with lawyers and defense lawyers uh, who I could see that, and you know, it might be a mindset. So if you ask why, um, we can discuss budgets and theories about the incentives within the, the within Department of Justice. We heard from Alex Wilson about how they, you know, want to do the right thing, and obviously they're doing God's work over there. But uh, but some have claimed uh, that there isn't enough will to pers to pursue this. Uh, and go after the evidence and you need to flip lower level employees and what you need to do. I, as a thought experiment, wanted to do this for Wells Fargo. What will you need to do to get how far? To Sharon Tolstead, who was the head of that division, all the way to, to Stumpf, who was the CEO. How, how, who could you say knew enough the head of, you know, when it went for years like that. And, and it was already in the courts in LA, the board can't say they didn't know on and on. So I spent a lot of time thinking just of Wells Fargo as a case, what, you know, did nothing happen? Did something happen? Was there harm? Who harmed? Anyway, so every case brings that. So there is plenty more to say, but, uh, but I definitely think we, we need more tools uh, to, uh, and, and, and in the last panel, Jennifer Tao brought up responsible officers. This is really where I, where I would want to just put meat on this concept. If you are an officer or a board member, you are charged with being responsible somehow for this corporation. And if the corporation did something that was knowable to you over extended period of time, then you have to, there has to be a way to think of it as really wrong when the harm was really, really large. And that harm, as was just mentioned, is large by, by any standard. And yet there's no viral video so the public doesn't go out to, to, uh, uh, to demonstrate. Uh, I welcome Brandon here. So we're gonna immediately go to him for the limited time he's with us. Yes, uh, thanks so much, Anat. So, so let me turn to Brandon. Uh, can, can you lay out some of the findings from your work on corporate criminal misconduct and how well the system is working in your view? Uh, and uh, we, we appreciate uh, your, your thoughts. Sure, sure. It's great to join you all. And thank you all for organizing this incredible gathering. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a really meaningful time to be having this type of conversation. It's been just about exactly 20 years since the Department of Justice first issued guidelines for the criminal prosecution of corporations uh, in the fall of 1999 by then Deputy Attorney General Eric Holder. And he, you know, he had an opportunity to revisit these things as Attorney General in the Obama administration. We've seen administrations come and go and we have you know, a transition now towards a new Biden Department of Justice which will undoubtedly bring with it yet another round of changes to the internal guidelines the Department of Justice uses in these corporate cases. A lot has changed over the last 20 years. Uh, things used to look much worse in terms of corporate accountability for criminal acts. If you dialed back to the 1980s or 1970s, the US looked like most other countries where although we had a strict respondent superior standard on the books and approved by the US Supreme Court and federal court, it was pretty rare for prosecutors to bother targeting a corporation outside of antitrust. In that area, we, prosecutors started to target corporations and develop policies surrounding leniency and cooperation in the 70s. But like most countries, although most countries didn't have an expansive strict liability standard for criminal liability like the US has long had, um, you know, there was not much reason to target a corporation. Fines were really small. And you know, to get a $20,000 fine from General Motors, like what is the point? Uh, the focus was on civil and regulatory enforcement. All that began to change in the era of the sentencing guidelines. 
And the federal sentencing guidelines were accompanied by a separate set of organizational guidelines with the Sentencing Commission recognizing that it doesn't make sense to have the same rules for sentencing a corporation or big organization as you would an individual defendant. For individual defendants, I mean, there are serious, serious injustices that came about because of the rise of guideline sentencing in this country, both at the federal and local levels. You know, there's a grid in your criminal history uh, and some kind of, a, you know, a seriousness of offense rating is basically what decides you know, how many years you get in prison. And these sentencing guidelines weren't based on empirical data about what the best way is to deter or incapacitate or rehabilitate offenders. These guidelines were basically based on the severity of what judges had been done in the past. And the attempt was to kind of reify that. Uh, in the context of organizations, there was this thinking that, well, and for organizations, you need to think about other factors. You need to think about structural dynamics and compliance and whether compliance is effective. There is a much broader thinking, including because the Sentencing Commission, after lots of debates, just couldn't decide what the goals were of punishing corporations or is it the idea to rehabilitate them or to reward compliance. They basically threw up their hands, decided it was complicated and issued these complicated guidelines which mostly aren't used because in at least the largest cases, corporations don't plead guilty and don't get sentenced under the guidelines. Uh, but what we did see is that those guidelines did permit um, serious fines, making it a very different financial matter to go after a corporation criminally. And during the 90s, you all of a sudden saw a, a antitrust in particular Fines that at the time were like were headline drawing fines, you know, $100 million, $30 million. Now we kind of laugh at that, really? $30 million, that's a big corporate case. But at the time, that was a big deal. Uh, and uh, what really changed, though, was post Enron, the Department of Justice was sort of looking back at what they've been doing in the 90s. Uh, they, they still were not very active in charging corporations. And during those Enron era financial scandals, there was a call for the Department of Justice and for the feds to get much more involved. They formed a corporate fraud task force. They did try individuals like at Enron and, and a few other high profile cases. And the thought was that they needed to, to ramp up. Uh, and there was a 2003 revision of those, that internal memo on, you know, how do we prosecute corporations, often called the Thompson memo after the deputy attorney general who was sort of the formal author of the revisions, lots of people collaborate on them. And they set out a set of nine factors, which were kind of all over the place in terms of what should be considered. Uh, I began evaluating data concerning the settlement agreements with corporations shortly after that memo was drafted. And you could kind of boil down, even though the memo said lots of things, what basically happened was that the message got around that what you can offer corporations to facilitate bringing more cases more efficiently with, with great results is to offer leniency uh, that companies will not be asked to plead guilty. They will not get criminal records. You can do this without judicial oversight, which takes time and you have to have a sentencing hearing and parties have to be notified victims. We're gonna get rid of all that courtroom procedure. We're gonna largely do these things out of court. And they started doing it through both deferred and non-prosecution agreements with deferred prosecution agreements being filed in court, but, but basically held on ice on the judge's dockets until the company complied. Non-prosecution was just an agreement with the company that we are not gonna file anything in court, just follow the terms of this agreement. And they were borrowing from things that the Department of Justice did in consent decrees, which are in court and out of court options, uh, mostly in, in other civil areas. Uh, the agreements contained big fines. They would sometimes call for independent monitors to supervise compliance. They would have terms regarding the compliance that a company was supposed to do to shape things up. They would include fines. Uh, and because there was growing interest in this area after writing early articles, I collaborated with John Ashley uh, at the University of Virginia Empirical Law Library uh, to create what is now a Duke and UVA registry. We now have you know, upwards of 4,000 entries we track deferred non-prosecution agreements, we track plea agreements with companies because there still are many more cases which, in which the company does plead guilty, mostly smaller cases involving uh, non-public companies. But some big, big cases do resolve in guilty pleas. And there was a focus on insisting on guilty pleas towards the tail end of the Obama administration. Also declinations, the occasional trial involving a company. Declinations are a more important fixture of 
the Trump administration policy sometimes will just decline entirely. Uh, we also were tracking in how many of these cases were individuals prosecuted alongside the firm and going to what Anat was talking about just when I logged in, uh, you know, most of the time individuals are not charged. Uh, that became the subject of more and more Department of Justice embarrassment and they announced some changes saying that no, 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 we're not just going to settle the case with the company, offer them some discounts and leniency uh, and move on without ever saying who did what. Uh, they started to include more detailed factual statements accompanying these settlements with companies so that at least there'd be, there would be some more public notice of who did what. And they also announced this policy that before we settle with the firm, we need to finalize any charging with individuals. I and others at the time said that, you know, that's very nice of them to say. Um, prosecutors have always wanted to charge individuals where possible. Like it was never something that was comfortable for prosecutors to say, we're not gonna care who did what, we'll just take a fine from the company. Um, but practically it's, it's incredibly challenging to figure out who did what. You know, these cases can involve millions and millions of pages of documents. The companies can hire entire law firms to go through those documents and make presentations to prosecutors. But prosecutors are like, lucky if they have, you know, one chief lawyer and two other lawyers assigned to a case, like a three lawyer, three US attorneys would be a lot. They can't hire entire law firms and figure out who did what. And I, you know, I described in my book in some situations where it was a big priority to, to pursue serious white collar prosecutions of large numbers of individuals, like in some of the tax shelter cases, like with KPMG and others. Plenty of those cases don't go well. They take years and years and years to litigate. If they had waited those years and years to, to, to settle with the company, there would have been big problems because those individual cases were only possible through the cooperation of the company and all the documents that the company has control over. Uh, the Yates memo was never likely to be used very carefully and it wasn't. I observed no change uh, before or after the Yates memo in the number of cases in which companies enter deferred and non-prosecution agreements and employees were charged. Even when employees are charged, it's often lower level people. There are occasional cases where there is high quality evidence rising to the top, to the CFO, to the CEO. Sometimes those are quite unusual cases, like in the Massey Cole case, it turned out to be like sort of like the, the Nixon tapes. There were tapes of conversations that the CEO was having with employees that you don't normally have that. Uh, and, uh, uh, so, you know, more recently when the Trump administration relaxed the Yates moment and said, look, we're not always going to do that. We're not always going to wait to settle the case until we have decided whether to charge individuals. I think that just reflected what they were doing anyway. And they, they expressed some of that. Uh, the uh, patterns in these agreements over time do tell us something. They certainly, we don't have information about cases, corporate cases that say are referred to prosecutors that they consider and that they do nothing with. Uh, and so there, there are a number of big black holes in the data and in terms of what we can understand about corporate crime, there's an even bigger problem in that by its very nature, many types of corporate crimes, and there's so many different types, uh, but they involve conduct which is concealed within complicated organizations. And by its nature, people who are defrauded are fooled. They don't know that they've been defrauded. Um, I mean, some, maybe sometimes you get a, you know, a scam email and you, you're pretty sure it's a fraud. Uh, and so, you know, all of us get, you know, are victims of attempted fraud many times a day in our inboxes or hopefully just our spam folders. But, you know, if something happens that, you know, where a company is concealing information from the public and their stock price wouldn't have done well had it been revealed, well, we don't know that we've been defrauded if we own that stock. If your company is concealing that it had known you know, for many months that something like the BP horizon spill could happen. And you know, people didn't know that at the time. And even after the BP spill, it took some time to figure out what the company was aware of in terms of, you know, safety conditions at that facility. Uh, you know, in forward and bribery cases, like companies are not openly bribing public officials in other countries. And so, you know, we have, it's not like there is good data that can tell us, well, how often do these crimes occur? And, and, and yet they are not reported to the authorities or the public. It's not like certain types of street crimes where, you know, we have a good sense of how many homicides occur in a given city and how many of those are cleared. And, you know, we have no idea how many corporate crimes of different types are cleared. Uh, there's better information in some areas where regulators uh, you know, are observing admissions and there's more self-reporting and there's a larger 
amount of regulatory oversight. Uh, but that isn't necessarily the case either. Like in the banking area, you know, large banks generate vast quantities of activity reports to regulators each year concerning transactions. And no one at the bank or at the regulator could humanly review all those suspicious transactions. It would be impossible. There are so many hundreds of thousands of those each year. And so, you know, the financial institutions comply by generating vast bulks of reports. They also have to have effective compliance and have to have humans, you know, doing a reasonable to good job, like reviewing all those reports and, and putting a stop to flagged transactions if the, that, but, but it would not be possible um, and that they certainly have automation to assist, certainly would not be possible for people to put their eyes on all those transactions and figure out which ones should have been prevented or should be remedied after the fact. Uh, and so you know, I think there are, there, you know, that raises a question about how often corporate crime occurs and we don't have that kind of information. How often does it occur? How effective is enforcement? How many cases go unenforced? How many cases do come to prosecutors' attention, but they don't, they decline to go forward with it. We don't know any of those things. We only know about cases that do resolve and some cases that resolve through declinations or decisions, public decisions, not to, not to further pursue a punishment or something like that. So we, we, know, we know something about corporate crime, but we don't, we don't know nearly as much as we could. And, Brendan, Brendan yeah. let, me, let me jump in for a second, because one thing that I've noticed, if you look at some of the settlements that the, the D Department of Justice has engaged in when they found corporate wrongdoing, sometimes they, they proceeded civilly, and there will be an announcement of very high fines. And yet, in the, uh, in the wake of the financial crisis, some of those civil penalties I thought were exaggerated. So, so there might be something that says, well, Citibank has to pay uh, you know, 500 million oh, yeah. in, uh, in some sort of penalty to, uh, to defrauded borrowers or something. And it turns out that what they are, are actually doing is that they're forgiving loans for people who are in bankruptcy and aren't going to be paying them back anyway. So there really yeah. is no penalty there, but the Justice Department must feel like they're getting something by announcing that there's a big penalty. The yeah. corporate entity is getting some benefit. Um, and and uh, I, I know you've thought about things like the Volkswagen admission uh, and emission test scandal. Um, uh, I'm just curious, what is it that uh, uh, can lead some of these corporate actors to engage in something? Is it the, the thought that they're, they're, they think they're going to get away with it or that the penalties if caught are not sufficiently strong? And any thoughts on that? Well, just starting with number one, with the question of the accuracy of the fine amounts or penalty amounts announced. Uh, the the eye-catching numbers are often quite misleading when you unpack them, just like you were describing. And what, we, what you described on the civil side is equally true on the criminal side. Uh, often there is not, although in some areas, like in the FCP area, there's, there are better practices. But often there isn't a guidelines calculation, like you have no idea, is a billion dollars a really low fine compared to the seriousness of the conduct and the profits the company made, or is it really high? Like the, and, and the public just sees, oh, they paid a billion dollars, maybe that's a big deal. Um, but often when you read the agreements and they do provide some information about how the amount was calculated, you see that this is, you know, um, you know I think I described in Too Big to Jail how when we do have a guidelines calculation, almost without exception, it is a below the bottom of the guidelines range amount that the company is being asked to pay. There is a provision that permits uh, prosecutors to impose a fine that is up to twice the losses to victims or the gains to the company. And you'd think they should at least have to pay a lot more than their gains. That's a punishment. They have to not only just give up their gains, but giving up your gains still, if, you, if there are other times when you don't get caught, that's not much of a deterrent. Give, paying twice your gains, that might be a deterrent. That provision has, I've never seen that used to calculate a fine against a company. But also, you know, they'll say, you know, whatever it is, a billion or $10 million, whatever the, the money is, Often when you read the agreement more carefully, you see, and by the way, we're crediting payments that were already made in other countries or to other people. Um, and uh, uh, the, uh, there are tax write-offs when it's a civil settlement. So maybe they're crediting, crediting a civil settlement, which may be deducted from the, the taxes that a company pays or spread out over time with some tax consequences. So there are all kinds of problems 
And of course, there's the larger problem that you all have been discussing that these fine amounts aren't paid by the executives that may have gotten compensation or had incentives to do certain things. Uh, they may be borne by shareholders if it's a public company. Uh, so there, there has been legislation introduced here and there to introduce more transparency to the reporting of fine amounts in these types of settlements. I haven't seen it go, go anywhere in Congress, but at least it's something that there's some, some concern in the halls of Congress that this is a problem that needs to be addressed. And I think it does. I mean, there's a separate problem that there are some corporate agreements that are entirely not made public. I mean, I, with my colleagues, have had to file multiple freedom of information requests because they're just non-public agreements out there. Um, I think that may very much make sense. And we're not asking for them in the leniency program context and antitrust. I think that's a good program to sort of encourage uh, companies and cartels to snitch on each other. But outside of that context, I don't see a reason to keep corporate deals secret. And they have, been, they have in the past been kept secret. And we don't know about the others that have been kept secret anyway. Um, so following the money is problematic. Um, this larger question though, why do these people think that they can get away with it? Uh, you know, like in the Volkswagen emissions situation, I mean, I think they probably, the relevant engineers probably thought that they designed a pretty good way of sneaking around emissions tests and didn't think that they were gonna get caught. Uh, in other contexts, there's sort of been, I mean, it's, it's common in organizational behavior where if everyone else is doing it, you think that it's okay. And not only that, you think that it's like a good thing, you're doing something good for your company. Uh, you know, I talk in my book about the Siemens case where it was just the way you did things to get pay bribes to get business around the world. And it was not just openly tolerated, it was encouraged and employees were given, you know, suitcases of cash to go around to, to win contracts around the world. And this was, this was their business model. They thought it was, you know, the same thing we were talking about Wells Fargo earlier. You know, employees were encouraged to sign customers up for every kind of account, whether they wanted it or not. And that was how you made your numbers. And, um, you know, there's a problem uh, of aggressive sales culture, whether it's sales culture or aggressive poor compliance culture in lots of these organizational settings. And there's something about it, a, kind of a crowd setting where, where you know, the, both the best and the worst tendencies in people can, can be brought out. Um, but you also understand how when a handful of employees are eventually prosecuted, they say like, well, why us? Like everyone was doing it and our bosses were telling us to do it, and you prosecute the bosses, they say their bosses were telling them to do it. Everyone was under pressure to do this thing. And that's why I do see some, some real use in focusing on the corporation for criminal liability, because you know Wells Fargo can just fire you know, tens of thousands of employees, or you know, Siemens fired a huge number of its top level management. Uh, but those, those people can be replaced. We can all be replaced at the organizations that we work for. Um, you know, at our universities, someone else can teach the courses that we teach. We're all, we, we, we can all be, you know, as, as, as wonderful as we think we are as individuals, we can all be replaced. Uh, but if the, the fundamental incentives and regulation and culture isn't changed, then, then nothing will change. Uh, you know, I think we really need to have serious regulation in place to monitor corporations. And we can't depend on prosecutors after the fact to provide that kind of monitoring. So Brandon, let me let me uh, bring to to you a question from the audience. I know we have a limited amount of time with you, so uh, one of the questions is: um, uh, I believe there's a practice around deferred prosecution or corporate integrity agreements that require the company to investigate itself and report what fines it owes. Is that true? And how big an issue is it? Well, yes. Yeah, so I mean, in general, like when a uh, if prosecutors are, are trying to find out, like how big should, how big should the fine be? You know, how much profit did you make from this activity? Uh, you know, how, how many victims were there? Uh, how costly was this to the public? They're gonna ask the company, like, can you give us some documents on that? And is it gonna be in the company's interest to maximize the number of victims that were involved? Uh, you know, and, and nor is this like a class action, you know, where there are plaintiff's lawyers that represent groups of victims that are coming in and questioning that and saying, wait, wait a minute, you know, we've identified tens of thousands more victims or, uh, or we have an economic model. We think that the share price did something very different. We actually think the harm caused by the securities fraud was much greater. You don't have any of that. You are supposed to notify victims now in deferred prosecution agreements. Congress actually is one of the few things Congress did do to regulate this area so that you have to do the same victim notification that you would if it was a plea agreement. Uh, 
uh, but the, the, the process is highly truncated and you don't have meaningful you know, hearings or litigation or an opportunity to be heard or any of these procedural rights. Uh, and instead it's all kind of negotiated and prosecutors are largely operating based on information that the company gives them. Companies are supposed to monitor themselves, but often, you know, for the most part, it's even in the deferred prosecution agreements, which tend to be public companies, really big cases, even in those biggest cases, and Vic can talk more about this, you know, the role of monitors, uh, monitors can play an enormous role where someone is brought in who's independent, who's paid by the company to report to prosecutors and to supervise compliance after the fact. But monitors are appointed in about a quarter of those cases. They're appointed in some plea cases too, environmental cases in particular. I have a new appreciation for the challenges of a monitor. The reason I had to miss some of this conference is that I'm, I'm the monitor in a civil rights consent decree in Harris County. And you know I'm depending on lots of data provided by the county that I'm monitoring. Uh, but at least there's this ongoing monitoring role reporting to a court. Um, there are many problems with that process. I think the public needs to know what monitors find. I've been involved in litigation to uh, release monitors reports. Uh, maybe not you know, specific employee information, but if companies aren't doing well during the monitoring process, in typical criminal cases, that would be made public. It would be part, of, it could be potentially a probation violation. Probation reports are made public. Uh, judges, when they have special masters in cases involving a criminal judgment, like a plea agreement, they make those reports public. The Department of Justice itself makes monitor reports public across the board when it is a civil consent decree. But in these corporate cases involving deferred prosecutions where the rules are kind of gray and it's largely out of court, public doesn't typically know what happens. And then we have companies that you know, get prosecuted multiple times over the, the years. Uh, maybe they say they're not recidivist because one time it was antitrust and another time it was foreign bribery, but they're repeated criminal prosecutions. You know, the, the, Many banks have been prosecuted three or four times at this point. It's unclear what reputational damage there is for being recidivist if, if, it is ha if, if it's happening to everyone. But um, it makes you wonder how well compliance is working, but we don't know because when there are monitors, we don't see the reports. Uh, we don't have judges particularly involved. And you know, my, my response, and I know some in this group may not like it, is that we shouldn't be counting on criminal law to solve these problems. It's, I mean, I think there's an increasing understanding in this country that putting people in jail isn't a good way to address social problems. You need real regulation and real world rules that challenging companies with criminal prosecutions after the fact can punish some of the worst actors, but is not gonna put the incentives in place ex ante that are gonna create sound rules of conduct that are monitored and followed. That monitoring should be routine, but not only for companies that get caught and prosecuted. Uh, and so, you know, there, there's, there's much more to say about how terrible the incentives have been that have been created. There are lots of incentives to, you know, not monitor yourself, not do serious testing of compliance at a company, because what are you gonna find? If you find problems, that'll be bad if you get prosecuted. Uh, you, you might feel like you need to self-report it and then you'll get prosecuted. But if you don't seriously test your compliance or uncover problems, you'll be doing nothing any different than a lot of your neighboring companies. And prosecutors have never said, oh, we will reward you if you do serious testing of compliance all the time beyond what our regulars insist on. They've never, you know, they don't even require monitors to make the reports public if you do get prosecuted. And so why would a company seriously test itself? Uh, and, uh, and so now, you know, we have a compliance industry, but, you know, a lot of what the compliance is, is, you know, employee trainings and spot checking and hotlines where people can call and make complaints internally or externally, and that's all good, but, but no one is seriously doing testing. And uh, we wouldn't leave compliance to that level of sort of lack, sort of just look at it yourself, and maybe if you get in trouble, we'll do something more in other contexts. You know, for the, um, the people who check us, in, the TSA folks that look for bombs, you know, they put fake bombs through those machines to see if they get caught by the TSA staff because they know that compliance failures can, can be a, a problem. You know, in clinical laboratories, they do serious proficiency testing of the staff because if people are looking at the slides and not detecting cancer, that has life and death consequences. But for many areas that involve white collar crime, um, they aren't doing spot auditing of like the sales calls to see our are people being signed up for accounts that they didn't ask for? They're not doing spot checking or requiring spot checking uh, 
of transactions to see whether additional cash is missing or was part of the transaction. And there, you know, there are lots of simple ways that you can do auditing and we do auditing in lots of contexts when we are sure that we want it to be done right and where quality assurance is important. And so it says something when in areas that are afflicted with criminal consequences, we don't insist on that kind of auditing and spot checking. And- uh, So Brendan, let, let, let me pick up on some of the themes that you just raised with an audience question. So uh, the question is, when you think about the overall impact of corporate actions that cause substantial harm, which would you weigh as larger, illegal activities versus legal activities? Um, and any, anyone on the panel want to take that one on? Well, that would probably vary a lot by the area, I would think. I mean, there are some areas where you have a lot of regulation and therefore a lot of the harm is from illegal activities. But in some areas, the regulation is not quite like that. And as a result, a lot of the activities are, are legal, at least you know, according to the way the law is written. So that I would imagine it varies with the, with the area you're looking at. Um, of course, a lot of the discussion on this panel has been about enforcement practices. So that presumes at least some plausibility of a illegal activity. And then you're in the world of worrying about what is the enforcement practices. And as Brandon correctly stated, you know, it, it's, um, uh, we, we don't do the kind of routine monitoring that would really be, I think, uh, valuable in this context. Uh, and it's surprising in some ways because we have models to look at, as you mentioned with scientific testing for you know, vaccines and other things. Um, th 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 there are things we could do and we can look at, but uh, for whatever reason, they're not going there. I certainly approached, you know, compliance folks at a number of big companies asking whether they would let us do basically psych experiments, uh, which would have the possibility of generating unhelpful information, but would be a way of stress testing compliance programs. And unsurprisingly, there has been a lack of interest. Okay, so, so I, I do have a, an interesting question here. Uh, uh, in terms of prevention of legal problems, a big part of the answer must be to get better leadership. Stanford's Charles O'Reilly has done a very interesting study about C-suite narcissism. Shouldn't boards and investors be more wary of appointing narcissists? Who knows? I mean, I'm, we're not, we're, we, we don't have any psychologists on, on the panel. <laughs> Uh, I'm sure there are lots of personality types and there's a quite a ver variety of personality types that can be suited to certain types of leadership. One thing I will say is that um, I've done some work looking at the board level and, um, and this question of when do public companies think it's compliance is a serious enough and an important enough issue that they make it a a, a topic uh, that the board has to be accountable for. I kind of think no matter what your, your personality type, if you're accountable for something in your job, then you'll have to at least do some of that job. Um, and, uh, you know, even in this age of, you know, there have been a lot of big corporate prosecutions and there are billion dollar fines in this country. You know, the, the fines like that don't exist in any other country. People are amazed at what's, you know, as inadequate as we think corporate enforcement is in this country. There's nothing like this anywhere in the world. And the rest of the world looks to the US as the place where big cases will be brought. And the, the countries that have adapted their corporate criminal codes and have adopted new enforcement strategies have all done that in reaction and in the hopes that maybe some of the fine amounts will be paid in their countries and not in the US. But uh, even with all of that, it is a tiny minority of public companies that have created a compliance committee within their board and it could just be cosmetic, like we're, we included in our analyses, you know, calling it the audit and compliance committee and not just the audit committee. Uh, but that said, changing the name may mean that, well, actually those board members in particular are on the hook if there's a compliance problem, they were supposed to be paying attention to that stuff. Maybe it means you need to have some board members that know something about compliance or pay attention to, maybe you actually need the, the, the compliance and not just the general counsel to be reporting to the board and offering updates and extra meetings and more work. We found that, uh, companies that had been prosecuted were more likely to have a compliance committee on their board. Uh, and that companies that created that compliance committee only after they were prosecuted uh, didn't seem to get any benefit from having done so. Um, and that there were more compliance committees in industries that have just been the subject of more 
prosecutions, like in banking, like in pharmaceuticals, but that even in those industries, it was still like, you know, 14% of companies had, had compliance committees and the like. And so, you know, uh, even turning from the day-to-day -day management and the CEO, uh, if you think about the, the board's role, uh, it's as important as compliance has become, it's still ill-defined and it's not something that most boards take particularly seriously. Well, let me jump in and, and uh, raise an issue uh, that we haven't talked about yet, which is what is the role of outside accountants? Because it depends on the corporate crime, right? There may be some crimes that don't involve, you know, accounting fraud or cooking books. They involve, you know, cooking other things. <laughs> I mean, we just had a huge accounting scandal in Germany, of course, the wire card, which uh, implicated yet again uh, Ernst and Young, and you know, KPMG was kind of coming in later, but. Um, you know, Ernst & Young has been involved in numerous uh, fraud and it has certified. Uh, so accountants are, um, so are supposed to discover fraud, but whenever there is a fraud, they say that they couldn't have found it or that it was too complicated yeah. or something. And then that goes back even to savings and loans. They always say when they're working for this. So it's a, it's a sort of, you know, issue or pay type of situation. If they, depends who they work for. Uh, what they find because they have their escape clauses in their own um, sort of code of what they're supposed to be doing. So basically, you know, it's not clear what it means that they signed off a, a financial report. So, uh, so that, and, and that's a very limited amount of information we get out of public companies, private companies, forget it. I mean, you know, uh, we know very little. Uh, and, and again, you get to whistleblowers, you get to anybody, you know, John and I, uh, our moderator uh, chat sometimes and he does gun control and other things and to the detection I would say at least when there's you know blood on the street we do know it in this country but you know in corporate uh, wrongdoings we so know so little just what Brandon was was saying I mean you know uh, to, to go back to sort of enforcement you know I'm now looking at the reason I'm not using the corporate prosecution website is because these numbers are so small relative to civil against corporations, which is what good jobs first, uh, you know, we're talking wage theft and other things that are not at all even coming in near criminal against a corporation, just a little dispute about money, you know. Uh, so there is viewed, even though theft is kind of a, you know, a word we use for individuals as something potentially criminal, robbery, and not in the context of a corporation, but in any case, take drug offenses, Take Controlled Substance Act. Okay, I mean, that is a violation to, for the drug dealer down the street who will go to jail by the sentencing guidelines. But, you know, recently they dropped criminal prosecution against Walmart um, Pharmacy. And of course, uh, there was nothing much happened to, to McKesson and all these drug distributors that did. Uh, you know, they were in the chain of, of, of distribution of opioids uh, and benefited from, uh, from this uh, drug industry that was all over the table and in white coats. So, uh, so what kind of justice do we have that people go to, to, to jail for consuming drugs or, or dealing drugs down the street, uh, whereas uh, pharmacists are told to just fill the prescription even though they know it's from a pill mill doctor. Uh, and so, you know, again, more and more examples of how unequal the justice is and how little we, we monitor. Yesterday, uh, uh, Tommaso Valenti said he drives safer in London because they'll catch him, you know, uh, slower than in Italy because they, he knows they'll catch him. So, you know, we don't have radar, you know, for corporations to catch their speed and nothing mm -hmm. of the sort. So I, I, I remember years ago when uh, uh, in the Disney Corporation, uh, Michael Eisner fired Michael Ovitz for misconduct and Ovitz walked away with an enormous severance package. And I wonder how much uh, that is a problem that, that companies, uh, executives know that what, even if they get caught and they are, are discharged, they're gonna walk away with- And they have insurance for a lot of stuff. So there's the officer and, the, and, and uh, director of insurance that the companies are, are paying. So on money, it's, it's hardly going to matter. And they are, always walk away with enough. Even the clawbacks in, in, um, in Wells Fargo were small relative to what people walked off with. I mean, let, let, me, 
Oh, oh go ahead. Uh, yeah, I was just going to say that, I mean, uh, one thing to keep in mind, I mean, uh, the insurance and all of these things, they cover things that are not crimes. But of course, that gives an incentive to people to settle for things that are not crimes. Uh, so, so people basically, and from the prosecutorial side, that is often a, a good outcome because they have a lot of other things they need to do and you get that sort of an outcome. Even in, even in the Sarbanes Oxley, where they said that, you know, executives had to sign their statements, uh, yeah. the clawbacks were only if the accountants restate. So yes. then the accountants stop restating. Yep. <laughs> All right, let, right. Let's, let's turn to our, our panel here, uh, Karthik Ramna and uh, Neil Mahotra. So let's start off with Kartha, who has a question about uh, or comment about capture of the justice system. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I guess, uh, you know, what struck me about this panel uh, relative to all the other panels in the previous few days has been, we've looked at various potential remedies to corporate capture of democracy. And we looked at the media, we looked at, uh, you know, experts, we looked at academics, et cetera. And we said, oh, they're captured too. And oh, they're captured too. But for some reason, we haven't said, oh, the justice system is captured too. Uh, and maybe that's a good thing. I think, in fact, <laughs> this is the one panel that's given me some hope. But I wonder why. Is it true that the justice system hasn't been captured? Uh, you know, why is it that we think that judges and prosecutors are perhaps relatively more independent than the media and the academics and so forth? And if there are any lessons to be learned from that? Well, no, I mean, I think that there, there is a theory that the, that the Justice Department is captured in the sense that the career concerns of uh, prosecutors in the Justice Department uh, are uh, making them less inclined to pursue individuals because of their own career concerns, because it takes longer and it's riskier. This is what Jesse Eisinger calls a chicken shit club. This is basically, he refers to them not wanting to take the chance on a loss because the courts have not been friendly to the government in LIBOR cases that did not succeed, in other cases it did not succeed. You know, you're in, in, in the UK where you come, uh, where you are right now, you know, all the cases against Barclays failed. One of them was against the corporate corporations because of, of the controlling mind issue, but four executives also went off and the, one of the lawyers of the uh, executives was scathing in an op-ed in the Financial Times saying that the serious fraud office was way wasting taxpayers' money and, and, and all of that. So even, you know, a case that they felt very strongly about and spent a lot of resources on to prosecute both the corporation and for executives, nobody was actually found guilty. So uh, are they incompetent or are they captured? Uh, uh, in this country, uh, there are claims that, um, that they're lax and that it sort of goes to the justice system and that it's somehow a revolving club and the usual complaints uh, you would hear. And of course, a lot of the enforcement of other things that are not in Department of Justice are back in the agencies that we were talking about in the SEC, in all the other agencies, look at Boeing and even the FAA or even the FDA on generic drugs. You know, all, I mean, these are the gold standards of regulatory agencies. I was thinking FAA and FDA and, you know, even there, read Bottle of Lies or read uh, or look at the Boeing case and you'll see that there is a little bit of, uh, you know, we let the companies do it themselves, which is what you see in corporate investigations, uh, that the company investigates itself and, you know, we then sit around the table and settle. Neil, do you want to come in? Well, I was just kind of build, I just had a comment building on Kartik's question, which was that, it, you know, in many places, at least in the US, judges are elected. Um, so they are, you know, they, they are like politicians in many ways, um, which does allow corporate influence and the things we talked about in the first session on money and politics. Um, and I think, you know, I don't, I don't know, I don't, I'm not an expert on literature. I don't know if anybody on the panel is to say, you know, how much do the donations to judges affect their ruling on corporate cases? There's a lot of anecdotal evidence from like West Virginia and the coal industry and other examples in Ohio. Um, there's been some observational research on that. Um, so yeah, just kind of curious if anybody had any thoughts on judicial elections, um, building out of Kartik's question. So yeah, I mean, you know, th there are a couple of things. One is, of course, that it depends what you're looking at. If you're looking at state judges, yeah, a lot of them are elected. Federal judges are typically appointed. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean there's no influence on them. It just means that the, the channel of influence will be somewhat different. Uh, one thing I would make more generally about Karthik's point uh, is that, you know, when we look at the justice system, we're looking at the end product. 
That is, we're looking at a case uh, which goes through a serious winnowing process so that typically when you get a case that gets to a judge, it's not like they can just dismiss it out of hand typically. It's been vetted a few times. Whereas when you're looking at other arms of government or other arms of influence, a lot of stuff is occurring in the shade uh, or in the darkness, if you prefer the analogy, right? Uh, the deals are being done outside. Now, one of the concerns, for example, with the deferred prosecution agreements is precisely that, is that it takes it out of the public eye and puts it into this kind of shaded area where it becomes more difficult for us to assess what, to what extent are you know, these various factors coming in and influencing things. Um, having said that, you know, uh, I think there's a general sense that the justice system, once you're in it, right, um, it exhibits more independence than say some other arms of the government. But that ignores the fact, of course, how do you get to the justice system? Um, and if a lot of the processes are put in place and are there, it makes it more difficult, then it's, it's challenging. But certainly one would make the argument that if you look at the federal judiciary, it tends to be more independent. You don't have, as Neil was mentioning, uh, judges elected there in the state judiciaries, you often do, not always. Uh, and that you would expect to have an impact, but yeah, it's, it's about what you're looking at in some ways. You're looking at a, a sort of curated thing as opposed to the original structure. Uh, Jerry Davis has a question about uh, compliance and surveillance. Uh, Jerry, do you wanna come in? Yeah, thanks. So I, I teach in a business school and one of the things that I've learned from my MBA students who worked in finance uh, is that under the banner of compliance, they live in a corporate panopticon where the company is sort of reading their emails and their texts and subjecting it to these analyses to look at the metadata of their emails and calculate eigenvector centralities. And they're kind of going, uh, turning it into a sort of corporate Stasi uh, to, to uh, watch out for uh, compliance issues. And I'm wondering if since we haven't talked about COVID in three days, which feels remarkable under current circumstances, but now that white collar workers are working from home so much, I wonder if there's a danger that under the banner of compliance, uh, we will implement this sort of corporate panopticon or corporate Stasi uh, even more uh, vigorously. And they'll say it so that we can root out corruption, uh, but it'll end up creating this sort of world that we don't want to live in. Of course, I mean, and, and any any tool can be misused in some ways, uh, and of course, the cons you know we've seen this in other areas, like anti-corruption tools are sometimes used to weed out political enemies uh, and things of that nature, and uh, that's certainly a concern. Uh, given the fact that a lot of compliance has become more data-driven uh, and become more sort of infotech-driven, I'm going to imagine that there will be a lot of data privacy issues that are going to come up uh in terms of what you go but it does suggest one thing which is if companies want meaning the higher ups in the companies want they can gather a hell of a lot of information about what's happening at the firm and so are you know uh, that suggests that maybe if there are ways to tweak that to get incentives to run in the way we think might be useful that could be a potentially powerful tool but I haven't seen a lot of stuff that suggests that there are ways to do that effectively. Maybe an office seen more, seen less. Or that they would go to the top. In other words, you know, you got the top um, monitoring the, bar, the, the the lower in the chain and they'll throw somebody on the bus if they if they feel like uh, getting rid of them. So, so there's all these issues about how do you get to the top? You gotta have to get a whistleblower or somebody to flip and be willing to testify and go up the chain. That's a very costly process. That's how they do, you know, get, you know, mafia uh, uh, heads or whatever. But I wanted to really emphasize uh, among the injustice uh, or, or, or problems of opacity is issues about privatization of the legal system itself and as well as access to law. So both the cost of lawyers, uh, the fact that certain co that corporations and their executives and wealthy people are able to afford better lawyers. Um, so that's a little part of the justice system more generally, but in, in the corporate context in particular, there are a lot of mandatory arbitration agreements that have been, um, made uh, legal and okay, uh, even though California and some states are trying to outlaw some of them, where customers and employees are barred from, uh, from using um, the legal system. And so a lot of, you know, a lot of justice in a corporate context does not happen in the courts at all, which is uh, uh, which has sort of been a theme to the deferred prosecution, to the non-prosecution. Uh, 
and um, and then to to class action suits that cannot be brought as well. Or of course, in the gig economy, there's absolutely nothing. And so surveillance again can be used against employees in Amazon or or in even in Whole Foods to not unionize all kinds of other things that came. We had a little thread of 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 uh, in the second in the first day with Alex and and talking about labor uh, being weak in the democracy or just just uh, low level employees being weak. And so again, in this sort of big chains all the way to the judicial system, there's just a lot of points of injustice uh, or opacity that, uh, that, 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 that as you step back, you begin to see in context. Uh, Martin Wolf has a question. Martin, can you? Can yeah, you sorry. I have several, but I know you're at the end. So I'll just ask one, um, which I think is to Brandon. He's not what, here. He's not here. Well, then any of you can ask this. <laughs> I'm sort of getting a feeling of total despair. So the question I have is, should we regard regulation and the law in the prosecutorial law as complements or substitutes in dealing with the sort of problems we've been discussing in the last few days? Do they work together or should we rely on one or the other? I'm getting the impression here that the law just doesn't feel very effective. Um, well, maybe I'll, maybe I'll start. Uh, so um, I'm a law professor, so I, I'd, I'd hate to say the law was completely ineffectual, uh, but uh, obviously there, there are, um, there are difficulties in how this is being enforced. It's not for a lack of written law. There's, there's no shortage of written law. The issue is typically that the people we think are making the decisions are not bearing the full cost or even some of the cost, it seems, of, of the consequences of what they're doing. Uh, and in that respect, I think it's important to think about ways in which we can try to get the law or other incentive systems to police this behavior more. Um, just as an aside, one of the most amusing, depending on how dark your humor is, uh, things about this area is that if you go to certain parts of Florida, you'll discover that there are a lot of bankrupt people living in $20 million homes. And you're wondering, why is that? How is that happening? And the reason is simple, is that in Florida, the law allows a bankrupt person to keep one house. They just don't care how big it is. Um, those sorts of things where people can hide money and uh, sort of keep it away from judgment, I think makes it a lot easier for people who are making decisions to feel comfortable that they don't, they won't bear most of the consequences. Realistically, judges, I think, are going to be reticent in imposing criminal sanctions on executives unless they think that they've, you know, that they've knowingly done something. That will require, I think, a lot more sort of building of opinion within the judicial community to do that. Um, whereas busting down these kinds of, you know, ways to hide money, I think might actually be in some ways less likely to meet the resistance of at least the judiciary. Whereas I think on the criminal side, one of the concerns of course is there are actually statutes that allow you to impose strict criminal liability on CEOs. The trouble is those penalties are trivial. They're like $50, $100, $1,000, something along that line, um, which you know, suggests that the law has kind of made incursions into things that might be useful here, but they felt limited in some ways in going further, either because of political lobbying or just there's a general concern about you know, sending someone to jail if you're not very confident uh, that you know, they had some degree of you know, mental element involved in it. And that, like I said, I'm not necessarily saying it's a good thing or a bad thing, it's just a thing uh, that one needs to be aware of. Anat, did you want to weigh in? I would like to say something, uh, which is that, you know, Martin, you asked about, you know, well, what, what should we do? Should we think of laws or should we think of regulations? Well, I mean, you know, I'm, I live in a business school. So, so in my world, people uh, think of, you know, have this false distinction they make. And it is a legal distinction that matters in terms of enforcement tools, but between laws and regulations. So whenever somebody says to me, oh, innovation, you know, innovation will suffer. Regu regulations harm innovation, which is sort of this mantra. Uh, and I say, okay, well, if we called it laws, would you like it more because you like rule of law, you know, so switch the word the regulation with the word law. So it's only a question of who writes the details and whether the law authorizes the regulatory agency to write something. So it's a technical difference. And I just use the word rule 
and rules are often made in the private sector. Like yesterday, we talked about uh, social media companies that have no laws associated with them, and they have the you know terms of service or the the community standards or whatever it is that they allow them to kick you out of Twitter or out of Facebook or whatever the rules they made up. Mark Zuckerberg specifically. So uh, so in other words, rules are made everywhere, and it's a question of of of, of their their uh, enforcement. What I think about the legal system, the, the justice system that's in, in our laws and with our governments is I just think the entire system was written with all the distinctions and what we criminalize and not criminalize and all that was not written with corporations in mind and organizations in mind. And that is what I think we have to rethink completely again so that we actually can think through what would be appropriate for in an organization setting, in a hierarchical big entity, uh, and, and, and it's similar to how you might impose that on government bodies as well. So I lump governance problems as both encompassing the private sector and the, and the government sector we need all power to account. And so there's there's the media and there is uh, the constitution and there is uh, the punishment that you can get. But you know, when you look at when you look at corporate at, at situations where people were angry with corporations, you know, I don't know, the, the Alabama, you know, the Montgomery Alabama bus strike. Was this against the bus company? No, the bus company actually was obeying local laws that discriminated against blacks that forced uh, you know the bus company to uh, to seat uh, whites in the front and, and 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 blacks in the back, so you had bad law. So we come back to it, I think, in every panel um, that the rules are not right. And Martin Wolf, you in your yesterday's column precisely ended with that. We need better rules, uh, and and that I think will be the the ultimate bottom line, and that's what we need to focus our, our, ourselves. So again, I was surprised that, that, that people view corporate governance as the hope, um, because, uh, you know, we have a huge distraction about corporations saving the world. Uh, Instead, we have to focus on, on, on rules. Uh, yeah, sure, the corporation will make some rule and we want it to be a better rule rather than a, a bad rule. But uh, if, if it's a democracy, and this is a conference on corporations and democracy, it's the democratic rules that have to work. Uh, yes. And their enforcement. Yeah, and, and, and just to pick up on Anat's uh, comment, um, we do have to rely very much on the integrity of the enforcers. Uh, during the uh, last Bush administration, there were, there were claims that uh, there was pressure put on US attorneys to go after political enemies. Uh, and of course, the, the current administration has undermined the sense of truth, which is really critical in every aspect of this, because if, if a corporation is able to cast doubt on whether their behavior is harmful or whether there's even a problem, uh, that would undermine the integrity of the system in a very profound way. So I, I have enormous concerns about that just very basic uh, issue right now in America that uh, people at a massive level seem to be uh, willing to believe things that are demonstrably false. And that is a danger to, to the democracy and, and all forms of uh, uh, corporate compliance and, and regulatory enforcement. Um, so any final comment from Anat or Vic? Uh, we're getting right to the end. I just wanted to give you one opportunity if you had a final uh, minute to sum up. Well, uh, sure. Uh, you know, uh, my impression is that, uh, you know, focusing a lot on the criminal, uh, criminal sanctions on the corporate entity, I'm not sure necessarily going to be as productive in terms of, you know, whether we're thinking about a new sort of approach as an author was suggesting to regulating organizational behavior. I do think the focus on individuals is important, but trying to figure out how we can prove it and know it and influence it is gonna be critical because at the end of the day, we need to be thinking about how we influence incentivize behavior. Uh, and there are lots of tools we can do it. It's not just monetary. There are lots of other things that can be done. Um, but we need to be, you know, thinking along those lines, not just uh, one particular solution uh, yeah. will necessarily work. And more generally, uh, you know, sort of preventing fraud and deterring fraud, uh, 
is not a one-shot deal. This is an issue of constant vigilance. It is not uh, something that you can put in place a system and say, turn it on, let it run. It's not quite that simple. Uh, one needs to be paying attention and watching how things develop. Any system can be corrupted be given enough incentives and time. So it's worthwhile to be alert. Yeah, so ultimately, you know, power corrupts, et cetera, et cetera. So I took, I, you know, I'm a business school professor, but my head is now in the law, which is why I'm on this panel. And so I sat through a course on white collar crime just to try to understand more uh, um, of the issues. And so again, I heard from the professors there too, uh, oh, and from others, uh, don't turn to the criminal justice system to solve and there's a whole book by Sam Buehler about these capital uh, offenses. Uh, don't come to the corporate, uh, to the criminal justice system to solve corporate governance problem. Okay, so everybody's saying it's not here, it's not here, it's not here. Uh, where is it then that we get the corporations to uh, to act uh, in in a democracy? Now, just a, a, a quick comment. On, you know, it's not necessarily that jail is important, the possibility of jail, but criminal uh, record is 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 an is is something, okay, is something, okay. So 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 it's it's a question of what we think is wrong. This is what society criminalizes, okay. When does a leader uh, do something we disapprove of? So we need to go and do maybe st studies in psychology to see what people view as 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 it gets their blood going, you know, it makes them angry to know that an executive allowed this harm and that harm, water contamination, you know, uh, pollution of other sorts, you know, defrauding customers, on and on. When they think that crosses the bar to the law should. Call, criminalize this for yeah. officers. And then we begin to have a set of laws for the judicial system to, to, to go. Current laws, I believe are not good enough. Even though many of my friends are telling me that willful blindness and other doctrines might help and that it's the Department of Justice that's just lame and all of that. Uh, I believe that some of this is true, but that it's not gonna be enough. Yes, thank you, Arnaud. I, th I think we've come to the end of our, our time. Yes. So I do want to thank our panelists uh, for a very engaging and, and provocative discussion. Uh, these literally are some of the most important issues uh, uh, dealing with some of the most profound problems for the US and indeed for the world. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, let me turn it over to Anad now. To me. <laughs> I'll stay for just two more minutes and, and wrap up the whole thing. So um, Luigi said in the previous panel, uh, talked about different kinds of corruption. And uh, you know, we think here that, oh, China is very corrupt and, uh, and, but now China has all these gilded age and all these oligarchs, and, but it has a very strong government. It's not a democracy. So uh, we don't use, as Luigi said, the word corruption in the US. Uh, there are some books about corruption in the US and a very recent one is uh, called, very recent, like a few weeks, uh, on corruption in America and what is at stake. It talks about corruptions in other countries, but it talks about what, what we call corruption in the state or we should call corruption in the state, which is more in the language of you know, influence and lobbying and money in politics that we view as uh, legal. So let me just conclude this conference and say, we hope that this was a food for thought and something for you uh, to continue to continue thinking about because another book that also came out recently and I will mention that we will create we will post all the videos and we will create a reading list because a lot of books came up uh, and that, that uh, I hope people in the audience will want to read and engage with and so um uh, another book was called Superman is Not Coming. And where I'm going with that is this is by Aaron Brockovich, who's from the movie uh, about, about the water uh, 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 problems with the corporation, same PG&E that I mentioned earlier about, uh, about uh, whether we get and what it takes in this country, in the US of A, to get clean water. And her point is you don't get clean water unless you fight for it, or don't assume that you get clean water unless you fight for it. So uh, Superman is not coming. It's on 
us. So in the political discourse in this country, and I'll end with that, I recently wrote an essay on democracy. This is very strange for a finance professor, but this is how far off I got. And it was called Other People's Money in one title and in, a, in the Stanford Social Innovation Review, a volume on realizing democracy uh, sponsored by Ford Foundation. It was called Democracy and Prosperity Require Uncorrupted Governments. And I just um, ended uh, that, uh, that panel uh, that uh, article by saying that we are presented with uh, with false choices. We have a we have a challenge in ensuring that that institutions of all kinds are trustworthy. But first, we cannot accept the simplistic views that it's capitalism versus socialism, that it's big government versus communism, uh, uh, free markets versus that. That's not where the action is. The action is we need better rules. And we need to focus our energy on that. Corporate social responsibility and all this other stuff is nice to have, but not gotta have. What we gotta have is, uh, is good rules. And that's worth uh, uh, good trouble, necessary trouble. Thank you very much.